August 25th, and this is the new Christmas Eve Board of Education meeting. We please all rise for the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God. So the um, board has just come out of our executive session and are back in public session. Can I get a motion to approve the agenda as stated, please? So moved. Second. second. Thank you. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Does anybody have anything to pull from the consent agenda? And I would like to pull item 3.4. Professional personnel free from the further compensation. That's correct. Okay, thank you. Does anybody else have anything to pull for this evening from the consent agenda? All right, so can I get a motion to approve the consent agenda, please? Can I get a second? Okay. All in favor? Aye. All right, so we have one item pulled for the consent agenda. And that is item 3.4 from the Professional Personnel Agenda Dash 3, Appointment for Other Compensation. Do you need more information to um, make a determination on that item? Yeah, I just wanted to know if we can um, describe a little bit the mentor position in the, that section of the... Yeah, so uh, school districts in, in New York State a number of years ago were um, directed to build a mentoring program for all um, new teachers to the district, new to the profession and new to the district. Um, I, I have to get back to you on what year it was, but basically the, the premise was for existing teachers in the district to mentor the new folks and um, give them an opportunity to uh, understand uh, sort of the ropes of, of the school district from the mechanics. I need to take a sick day, um, lesson planning, uh, how to like health insurance paperwork, some of the nuts and bolts, all the way to curriculum uh, or, or best curriculum practices, instructional strategies, um, co-teaching with them in terms of dealing with classroom management or uh, new expectations. So they're really uh, a peer-to-peer. -peer. It's not a, an administrator that, that is in a supervisory uh, capacity working with a teacher. It really is intended to be peer-to-peer. -peer. Uh, to do so, uh, we post for mentors, we interview the mentors, uh, and they go through a process to be qualified and then ultimately tonight. We also have a teacher, a, a mentor coordinator, um, that is our liaison with POSIs in New York State to make sure that they're uh, going through all the latest requirements and so on and so forth, uh, and then we fill out a report each year. Um, so it's, it's a really exciting initiative to really handhold, I guess, our newer teachers all the way through their first three or four years of our, uh, of our system and works with them on their professional portfolio, which is something that the board will have access to um, each spring. The board reviews privately uh, new teacher portfolios and uh, gives you an opportunity to see their growth over time and what the role and the relationship with the mentor was. Do you have any other questions? No, I'm good. I cleared it This has been a, a, an interesting summer. Last year, as you remember, um, New York State came out with guidance in July. The governor came out with additional guidance, uh, the former governor, on August 7th. And we certainly had much more time 
uh, to build our school system around what the new mandates were. There were executive orders from the health department, executive orders from the governor's office, executive orders from the state education department. In late July this year, uh, the governor, uh, through the uh, commissioner of the New York State Department of Health, basically said there will be no guidance from any New York State agency because all of the executive orders that governed all school districts last year expired, they sunset. And the state said they, at that time, had no intention to reauthorize those executive orders. That's when people started to go a little crazy because we were building a school year to start September and October the way that we ended. Uh, we ended with masks were indoors but not outdoors. Uh, throughout the year last year, there were changes to each athletic season. Those changes were based on infection rate as well as what those sports were and, and the physical contact that they, that they endured. Social distancing moved from six feet to three feet. Uh, we were able uh, to exercise some uh, looser restrictions in terms of music and phys ed. All of that were governed by either the governor, health department, or the state education department. Two weeks ago, uh, two weeks ago yesterday, when the previous governor indicated his resignation and that the current governor, Kathy Hochul, would take over, she indicated that she would, either by executive order or by direct health department that she would uh, she signaled that she would be making some statewide decisions for all schools uh, those decisions were communicated a little bit yesterday and that's what I shared with our families uh, anyone in a school public or private will need to be masked uh, the governor also said that uh, she is determining how best to increase the level of vaccination among uh, all school staff as well as students right now there is uh, it is not possible uh, or legal to mandate vaccinations for children or for staff in public schools uh, she's trying to find a way to either make that happen uh, or to increase the percentage of students and staff that are uh, vaccinated and she's also um, going to use some federal and state money uh, to try to increase the amount of uh, COVID testing for staff and students um, so that districts could have quicker data on who uh, is infected uh, and of course who is not infected because the infection rate uh, in combination with the um, uh, percentage of folks vaccinated is really what the, the incoming governor has indicated or signaled would drive some of the public policy. For example, three feet of social distancing, um, have re uh, reduced social distancing um, or mask wearing, as we said earlier, outside. So we have communicated with everybody um, what we know and what we, can, uh, what we can implement. And we have been signaling that, the governor had been signaling that to schools for the last couple of weeks, and we've been sharing that, <clears throat> we've been sharing that with our community. So, so here's what we do know, and, and again, not, not to read the email, but want to make sure uh, we're crystal clear. We will have educational programs every day for all students. Um, schools will follow their schedules pre-COVID, so dating back to the 1920 school year. You may remember, for those of you who had middle schoolers or high schools last year, we had to shorten the school day to accommodate for uh, screening. Um, screening is not mandated. Uh, this year and it sounds like the governor is is going to try to increase the number of tests uh, of tests available as opposed to screening uh, while certainly we uh, that was an extra mitigation layer I think it, it was universal feedback from school districts across the state that the screening uh, really didn't have an impact on um, containing uh, or, or stopping the spread of the virus and Families who were filling out the screener, I'm sure, you know, driving your child to school or putting them on the bus, and then you remember you had to do the screener uh, hours later. Um, three feet of social distancing in classrooms uh, were possible. We're going to try to achieve six feet of social distancing, um, and we'll talk about that in a minute in terms of, of all of the dominoes that uh, are connected with, uh, with, with that task. Uh, as we said earlier, masks indoors, regardless of your vaccination status. Um, students who are quarantined 
um, by law are eligible to receive instruction. Um, we will uh, be able to provide digital um, instruction uh, to those students who are, who are quarantining. Um, for now, back to school events will be held virtually uh, until we receive more guidance from, in this case, it will be the, the health department. We're gonna try to use uh, the outdoors of schools to the greatest extent possible. We had music practicing outside, phys ed outside, we had students eating outside, mask breaks will continue to take place outside um, as, we, as we did last year. Now that the governor has made this signal, the health department, the county health department, is charged with rules and regulations for public entities in Westchester County in terms of guidelines for contact tracing and guidelines for quarantine. And it's a county health department function. We meet, as superintendents in our region, we meet with uh, the county executive and the health department every single Monday. We talk about these issues. And the, and the county health department um, wanted to wait until the governor first was sworn in, second, made her signal uh, public, as she did yesterday at 3 o'clock, before they started complementing her vision um, in terms of, of health department regulations. This coming school year, in terms of quarantining and in terms of uh, uh, related issues with uh, contact tracing, is going to be different. And the reason it's going to be different is because of the vaccination status of staff and students. Um, we have a, a guess of what the health department was considering weeks ago. Um, that was before uh, the incoming governor, that was before the previous governor resigned and, and our current governor was, was sworn in. But it would not surprise me uh, that the quarantining and the contact tracing process will be different based on your vaccination status. In fact, uh, it's almost a guarantee that it will. It will also be different based on your social distance. Last year, we were quarantining large swaths of students because they were generally eating lunch in the classroom, if we're talking about elementary students. Um, we, are, we, have been, uh, we have been told that the uh, health department is going to be a little more specific about quarantining uh, as well as contact tracing while students are eating. Um, because of the infection rate and also because of, of vaccination rate, particularly those who are 12 years of age and older. So uh, the governor yesterday said that she will uh, have more information for us by the end of the week, so that's in the next two days. Uh, the health department probably will complement that uh, with their uh, requirements for quarantining and contact tracing. We'll share that as soon as we have it. The, the health department has not approved any plan for the school year with regards to quarantining and contact tracing. That is their responsibility. And I don't mean their responsibility from, we don't wanna do it, it's their responsibility to do it. They are the only ones, the county health department, New York State Health Department, that can quarantine, direct people to quarantine. We assisted them last year and did 99% of the work, but we were communicating or we were giving quarantine orders to staff and to students based on the criteria set forth by the health department. We uh, had to give contact information to the health department and the contact tracers. Sometimes they followed up, other times they didn't, but that was their responsibility. Anyone who tests positive that we knew about in school, we reported that to the health department. Um, they reported it to the state. We had to identify all of the folks that were in close contact. If we had a question or we weren't really sure about a particular situation. We had a hotline um, to speak with members of the Westchester County Department of Health, and they walked us through. Um, they walked us through the decision-making tree, and it was never the same, right? And and we heard about that last year. That while you know, if one student showed up to BV who was positive, and another at Furnace Woods that was positive, why were more kids or less kids quarantined, so on and so forth? The calculation that the county health department. Uh, had to take into account was very, very um, specific. Liz Gilio, our transportation director, was watching videos of, of how long um, students were on a bus to see if they met the 10 minute requirement, because that was the requirement last year. Uh, teachers and principals had seating charts 
for, um, for lunch, for all of the classes, so on and so forth. You'll remember that elementary students basically didn't leave their classroom last year um, because we wanted to try to control, the, the recommendation was to control the spread and not have kids in halls and in, in small spaces, so on and so forth. So um, the health department is committed uh, that they will, they will give us their requirements for school districts to help enforce, but it's super important that I remind everyone, quarantining requirements, contact tracing is the function of the health department and last year we assisted them with it we we certainly earned our badge uh, of, of stripes to be uh, you know de deputized health department officials but they and only they can come up with those guidelines uh, and that becomes basically the law of the land um, until they advise us differently um, what what has made this a little confusing or perhaps annoying I would say is that there are other counties in the state whose health department came out in front of the governor's comments and made their decisions and schools were able to communicate uh, information about quarantining uh, and contact tracing weeks ago they now are going to have to revisit that based on what the governor uh, has signaled that she's going to mandate so I've said to people that that the beginning of our school year is going to look more like the end of last school year rather than the beginning of last school year. Um, we're meeting with our elementary principals tomorrow. Uh, uh, I know of at least two of the schools, they've sent out the back to school information. They're having orientations next week, next Tuesday and Wednesday. Uh, at those orientations, they'll, be, they'll provide parents their plans for lunch. We're hopeful that all students will be able to eat lunch in cafeterias, but the goal is for students to eat lunch in cafeterias and be six feet apart because uh, if they're within six feet apart maskless eating lunch and someone tests positive we now need to contact trace everyone within six feet or sometimes within six feet of that uh, of that child so we're trying to create the environment up front that will mitigate the need for uh, contact tracing and for many many um, students to be uh, to be quarantined Last year, it really wasn't, um, it wasn't, it wasn't feasible. Students were eating in classrooms, uh, and the requirements back then were different. Um, but we're able to achieve three feet of social distancing in all of our classrooms. We did use some of our federal funding to uh, uh, retain and hire some additional teachers at elementary to bring that, uh, to bring the large class sections down. So we have fewer kids uh, in the classroom, so we, we certainly can, um, more than achieve three feet social distancing. Back at the high school, they'll be back to the normal schedule. Last year, they had a dedicated lunch period for the entire school. Um, they'll be back to their three or four periods of lunch. So uh, you take a high school of around 700 kids, divided by three or four lunch periods. We're able to spread them out here. We'll probably also use the dome or other spaces to make sure they can at least be six feet apart. Um, that's what we know, and I certainly um, feel that, and appreciate the frustration um, because at least last year, as crazy as last year was, a lot of those decisions were made and we were given some runway um, to adapt and adjust. Um, but but the, the health department um, and being echoed by the former governor at the end of July saying, the pandemic is over in the sense of the executive orders have expired uh, was was really a shock because that was not you know we intended um, to open the school year the way we ended based on those policies and protocols but the executive order was uh, suspended uh, and not only was it suspended the legislature took back the ability for for the former governor and any future governor to make certain um, executive orders around health and safety. So uh, Kathy Hochul has an interesting dilemma here because uh, her language was very clear. She was directing the health department to make some of those decisions rather than those decisions being executive order. Uh, and that is because of some of the legislative maneuvering that happened in Albany last spring as a result of the pandemic. So. Um, is, you know, the, the, the moment we get information, we try to share it with families. 
Uh, we try to get the information out there after we process it. We consult with our attorneys. We consult with the health department. We consult with our safety consultants. We consult with the New York State School Boards Association, uh, superintendents council, uh, with a lot of different agencies to make sure a number of things. That we heard everything the same way, that everyone is responding in similar fashion based on the resources they have, uh, and that no one is um, knowingly uh, building a plan for a school year that doesn't meet the criteria that's set forth. So that was a, a big update um, for, for many people. They, they either heard that before, or they read that before, um, but school districts are in, we're all in the same spot. And there were some districts that you know, came out very bold and aggressive a number of, of weeks ago or months ago, and they now are changing their plans. For example, there were schools in the Buffalo area, um, I think it was Erie County or maybe Niagara County, created different criteria for returning to school, and now the governor's comments and what's anticipated out of the uh, executive side of the house and the Department of Health, they now are changing the plans that they've been spending weeks getting ready to implement. So um, if, if you're frustrated, we appreciate that. This is, uh, you know, we, we, we think or we thought we saw the light at the end of the tunnel. We ended the year in, uh, in really a, a much more festive fashion compared to uh, the experience that, that kids and all of our staff had to endure. Um, but this year, as I said, this year we're going to begin in similar fashion to the way we ended and, and not as um, not as separate and, and sterile, not from health sterile, but, but uh, you know, a, a very sterile opening last year. Thank you, Joe. Thanks for being Thanks. so on top of this <laughs> and trying to take care of all the details and keep the school community informed. I'm going to go around the uh, table and see if we have questions and I'll start with Jen at the end and we'll just go all around. So just take I just want to confirm so three foot of social distancing will be maintained in all classrooms. So numbers the classrooms are have been adjusted to allow this to happen throughout right. from kindergarten all the way to twelve. Yep. And has the county given us any um, date of when they are prepared to give us their plan? Has they uh, when we met with them on Monday, they knew the governor was being sworn in Tuesday at 12.01 a.m. and that she had her, her press conference yesterday at 3 o'clock. Um, I know Westchester County was also consulting with their other county departments of health to see um, how close they were, or how aligned they were. I think the issue the counties have is they're trying to be Rather than a statewide approach, which is which is the way we opened the year last year, um, and the statewide approach, uh, you know, was the right thing or the wrong thing, I, I don't know. But the infection rate throughout the state moved wildly. You know, it wasn't the whole state all the time that had an infection rate. And so throughout last year, the governor and the state department of health backed off a little bit and gave more responsibility to the counties based on the county infection rate. So what our county has been doing has been working with Rockland and uh, Dutchess and Putnam and, and the counties on Long Island because our infection rate has, has the, the infection rate in that geographical area over the last 18 months has been more similar than compared to the Adirondacks of Southern Tier or Western. So, um, that's a long-winded answer of saying I think they're trying to get the metrics right because I think they want to communicate here's our plan and if we achieve lower infection rate by X and then by Y by Z they, they want it to be inspiring <laughs> you know, get your get your vaccine or keep your mask on or you know uh, don't do anything that you know that could spike the infection rate because here is our pathway to normal. <coughs> And that really was the signal they gave us on Monday, was they didn't just want to say, here are the rules, and we'll call you later. They wanted to say, here are the rules, and here, here are the avenues um, to loosen the restrictions. But the restrictions are going to be loosened based on infection rates. And then, so testing, I know she said that she would, she's looking to provide some sort of plan for testing. Did she give you any, did she give any indication of what that would mean? Does that mean, like, there are less test sites around. So would she 
Yeah, like, so like tools, like what, yeah. yeah, part of our commentary was was that um, they're they're working with a testing company and I think writing to uh, you know create the funding flow from the federal government to the state government to to using I'm you know saying Rite Aid uh, as an example uh, where there is a relationship that if students or staff went to Rite Aid to get tested and identify who they are and what school district they go to. All of that information will be reported back to the district um, in a much more quicker fashion. Um, you know, last year, for example, I, I was COVID tested. Uh, I had symptoms. Um, I actually had two tests. I had a negative um, saliva test, but because I had symptoms, um, they highly, highly recommended, and because of my function being around other staff and kids, I had a PCR test, and at that time in early December, coming off of Thanksgiving and, and the big spike, took five days to get my results back. So I was sidelined like many staff or many families or many students were. So um, the, the, the tests have become more accurate, there's more funding now, and so the governor is trying to create a streamline, um, you know, partnering with testing companies and partnering with existing pharmacies. The county was on the heels of rolling out a county testing plan. On Monday, they were, share, they were sharing with us what their vision was and wanted to hold off until, you know, what the governor mandated or couldn't mandate. We as a school organization cannot unilaterally mandate that people get vaccinated or people, um, people or students get vaccinated in order to work or in order to come to our schools. That can only be, that can only be um, through an order um, the governor of the legislature. And the same thing with testing. Um, testing would be optional. Now, what I anticipate is that a negative test is going to be a criteria to shorten your quarantine period. That was not the case 12 months ago. It was you were quarantined whether you had symptoms or whether you tested uh, positive or negative. What we believe the county is going to come up with are different criteria that will create a longer or shorter quarantine period based on, well, are you vaccinated? Were you wearing a mask? Um, were you symptomatic? And, um, and testing. And, and, and what test did you take? When were you tested? And, and what the results were? And one more question. Sure. So in the lack of guidance from the state, any guidance within schools is made by their administration, such as, you know, I guess cafeterias or lunchrooms seem like it would be something that would be gu guided from the state, we're thinking, or from the health yeah, department. I mean, yeah, the goal, the goal is to, to not create an environment that will, um, the goal is to create an environment based on the criteria we know that would limit the possible spread to mitigate the spread and would certainly mitigate people being out of school by way of being contact traced. Okay. Yeah. So one way hallway is those items are more from the lockers and when those are more like school bound guidances like that's, yeah, that's so, how you envision it. Yeah so last year you know we, we tried to we tried to control traffic flow and not have people passing each other because remember a year ago we were really nervous about saliva and people talking to each other and uh, and also trust, you know, to make sure that, that we were able to manage and supervise the environment. Um, you know, same thing with lockers, especially at the middle school and the high school level. You know, last year's backpack, if you had a middle school or high school, it became a, um, a power cord, a laptop, and <laughs> something to write with and write on. You know, they weren't slugging around, you know, the, the big 30-pound textbooks from all of their classes. So that was to control and limit exposure in short and small places because if Allie and I had a locker next to each other and I tested positive and she would need to be contact traced, that's just one more thing uh, um, that we would need to consider or one more potential person who could have been infected or even if not infected, we were, we were within proximity, we met all the criteria for her to be quarantined. So a lot of those strategies were mitigation strategies that were recommended by CDC to really keep people away uh, and apart so that um, you mitigate the spread. Okay. That's it. Sorry. 
Alexa? Yes, so let's see. Um, I think my first question is, is the guidance or the mandate that's going to come from the state on the mask wearing, is there anything that they are going to give us or direction they're going to give the districts on what this looks like for our children with special needs or medical conditions? Is it going to be a blanket statement and then you have to make accommodations for somebody who? Yeah, so um, if it's similar to last year, there were, they came out first, they say a mask and then it was face covering and they, they got a little more um, specific. We had kids with gators, the, the, the gators, the little, you know, things. Um, and they were they were getting a little more specific. Um, we did have, uh, I, I believe, some students um, for many different reasons that I won't get into um, didn't wear a mask, but they had other mitigating um, other mitigating apparatus, whether they were shields or whether they wrapped around or other things. So okay. yes, we accommodate them. Okay. Um, we would in a, in a non-COVID, non-pandemic year that involves uh, the child uh, pediatricians. Mm -hmm. um, they send us information. We check it out with our uh, school doctor. And if we need to approve any accommodations, that's how they have it. So where would a parent go for that? Is there a certain they, person? They start with their doctor. No, I mean oh. in our district. Um, well, they would, they would start with their principal, and the okay. principal would, would likely send it to the office of, of PPS. Okay, cool. Yeah. Awesome. Um, so just to kind of reiterate, the quarantine rules, days, all that is in the works in a few days. Hopefully we'll know, and we'll clearly be spelling that out to people um, on what to expect before the following week when school begins. Yes, and only awesome. the Department of Health can make that order. Okay. Yep. yep. Um, and you had mentioned that there would be digital instruction for the children that are quarantined. Is, what does that look like? Is that something that... that yeah, so, la so, so last year our middle school and high school model was a hybrid model where if you were at home, because again, we cut the enrollment in half to try to mitigate the spread, all of those mitigating factors. Um, if you were at home, whether it was not your time to come to school, or you were quarantined, you could you know, zoom in. We didn't use Zoom, but that was just the, you know, what, we, what we call it. They could zoom in. Um, so we were able to improve that functionality in our middle school and high school over time. Uh, at the elementary level, if you were quarantined, we provided the classroom teacher with release time to check in with those kids that were quarantined throughout the day. Um, you know, we, we tried to check in with them for at least an hour, sometimes it was more, but it was, you know, beginning of the day, midday, end of the day. Um, that's a discussion we're having with the elementary principals tomorrow. Um, there's also the potential um, that we may need to use existing staff as not remote teachers, because we, we're not permitted to have a full remote model, but to be dedicated to really be tutors and a conduit between the classroom teacher and kids that are in quarantine. The, the most the efficient way is for the classroom teacher to keep checking in mm -hmm. um, because it's much harder at the elementary level to be teaching two groups of kids at once. Mm -hmm. Attention span, just the function of the curriculum, uh, the, you know, the, the need to um, have more eyes and ears on the kids in front of you than perhaps at the secondary level. Uh, and it was easier at the secondary level last year because you know, by, by April, uh, I shouldn't say that, maybe by February through the rest of the year, we were hovering around 30% in school attendance rate. So oftentimes a teacher only had a handful of kids in front of them, so that supervision wasn't an issue. But um, that's also being spelled out tomorrow. Of of course. So what about the family that's doing the right thing and their kid is symptomatic? They're not mandated to be quarantined, but their family's doing the right thing. Will they have access to instruction? If, if their kid is symptomatic and they're weaned, they're pending testing or they're just going to wait the day out to see? Like if, a, if they're part of a quarantine order, yes. But if a parent's just keeping their kid home sick, they're not? Yeah, that's a slippery slope. Um, and that's a conversation we're going to we're going to have tomorrow because that to be honest that's what happened last year what happened last year with the hybrid model in middle school and high school was um, it easily became an option to come to school rather than an expectation and 
we got to a point where, um, and, and when we, I'm saying middle schools and high schools in the region said, they're online, they're engaged, they're, they're present, and it counts, right? It counts. That permission, uh, all of those permissions go back to what I said earlier, expired and, and haven't been renewed. So if the governor of the state education department says otherwise and says school districts must provide, then absolutely we must. But that's the slippery slope. What if they were exposed outside of our school setting? Like what if they were exposed at church? Or they just weren't if, well? if they were exposed and there was and and contact tracing took place and the Department of Health okay. was notified, we then would be notified okay. that so and so has a quarantine order. So we did ask kids, we asked kids and staff to produce your quarantine order. Um, and there is a quarantine order, it's a document. Unfortunately, at the moment, anyway, the um, tests have a 24 maximum on 48 hour turnaround. So if your kid's not feeling well, one of my kids had a cold this summer, took them for testing, we had the result the next day. So it was only, you know, so you could prove that hour was a cold. Quarantine. Yeah. Okay. And by the time you're symptomatic, the test should be gone. Right. Thank you. Yeah, no, for sure. Um, I, so one other thing that I think is really important for the public to understand is I think most people are under the assumption that a board gets together and talks about what the school year is going to look like and what how COVID is impacting it. And I think it's important that, that people understand that us sitting here are not sitting down saying, every kid's going to wear a mask, they're going to do this, they're going to do that. Um, and obviously everyone knows now the new governor is implementing that, but let's pretend she did not. In our district, is it, it it's, superintendent and the administration that makes the calls based on the recommendations that are coming to them from multiple resources or is it the board that comes together and figures out what the school year would look like in regards to a health situation like this it depends and the reason it depends is it's around whether it's educational policy or public health policy mm -hmm. so if our board wanted to let's just let's go back three years ago the board wanted to implement masks just as a super duper safety precaution yeah. not knowing anything we know now the board could do that and the way the board would do that is through amending existing policies that uh, I'm going to sound crazy and I don't mean to but that the board would implement uh, basically a uniform policy a face covering uniform policy and we would have to go through the process of making that policy we would have public meetings, we would get public input, and then having to make that decision. Mm -hmm. So there is an avenue, um, probably wouldn't be popular, but yes, there, there is an avenue mm -hmm. based on, you know, again, I'm, I'm sort of being cute about it, but going back to the it depends. It depends, um, it depends what the urgency is that's creating the policy. You have policies that are, you, we, have policies that are mandated uh, by either the federal or the state government, and then you have some you have some forced choice policies. You got to pick one or the other, and then you have free choice policies. So it really would determine what category those fit in. And before we adopt uh, any policy, we make sure if it's a medical policy that our, our uh, medical director reviews, uh, or any other policy that our legal counsel does. Um, and I think the last thing on my list was just if you could because until Carol shared with me, I wasn't aware. Um, what's going on with athletics in regards to COVID? Um, you know, if you're not a high school parent, you might not have got the, the update. Yeah, so we, we actually put those updates uh, online. I think they're online now, I didn't check. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> but on, until further notice, we're using last year's rules in terms of high risk sports or not high risk sports. If you remember last year, all of the athletic seasons got delayed and then therefore truncated because at that time, the state education department and health department wanted to track the um, infection rate and they also just wanted to study whether or not kids should be wearing a mask and playing football. Should they be wearing a mask and playing soccer, so on and so forth. So about that in time. Um, we were instructed by the New York State Athletic Association um, as well as the County Department of Health because the County Department of Health got involved last year with high-risk athletics, the governor, the governor put it on county departments of health, was to um, begin at least the practice season, which for us began on Monday, 
under last year's guidelines and we expect new guidelines before competition starts. Got it. But we're like, everybody's playing. Oh yeah, they're playing out. football, yeah. volleyball. So, oh yeah, they're out there and, and awesome. we're on time. That's great. Um, in, in terms of what a typical uh, yeah. duration of the season would be. Awesome. I think that's it. Uh, I have two questions. The first is, how are you going to collect vaccination status information? Uh, we can't mandate it. It's um, voluntary uh, submission only. We do have vaccination status of some staff that um, took uh, paid time to get vaccinated last year. And in order for them to, um, to use paid time off, the board approved that for every employee. Um, they had to submit proof that they are vaccinated. So we have that data from last year. Um, we're, we're putting a survey together, again, voluntary submission survey of uh, who's been vaccinated since, of all of our employees, and eventually um, all of our students. The reason we hit pause on that is because I think there will be a different um, response rate perhaps to the survey once the county department of health clearly articulates their guidelines for contact tracing and quarantining because they are going to use that your vaccination right. status as a as a um as a caveat in terms of what your duration is but is a parent going to have to prove vaccination status or no. they just no they're, they're going to say we're vaccinated and and so once they say that their child does not get caught up in or potentially it's not going to be caught up in quarantine. Not, not from us, they would be identified. We identify everyone for contact tracing. The contact tracers, when they receive the report, they determine who is or who isn't vaccinated, and then they may Come they may follow up. So for our purposes, if we all need to be quarantined because we were eating lunch for three hours without masks, you know, within two feet of each other, the report would would be all of our names and addresses and contact info okay. without without indicating vaccination status and the people on the other side in the health department would follow up and say this person this person this person doesn't need to be quarantined mm -hmm. they're not going to say it's because they're vaccinated they can't but that would lead you to believe that they are so are you feeling hopeful that that the department of health is going to have a quicker turnaround because remember that was a problem last year that they were taking days to follow oh, because up. we were quarantining everyone yeah, yeah, uh, and and vaccination status, I think, is going to result in a shorter quarantine period. Yeah, but that and that's why that's why the governor indicated yesterday she'd like to mandate that to speed up the process. Right. You know, that's not that's a that's not a popular take with some people. For me, responsible for twenty three hundred kids and a thousand staff. I like that because that will quicken up the process and will keep more kids right. and more staff. That's the list to begin with. Yep. Okay. Um, and then my last question is for parents and community members that want more information that have specific questions either about their school or about the policies or decisions we are making, how and where and whom should they contact? Yeah, so we're, we're finalizing an FAQ. Um, for those of you who looked at our FAQ from last year, it was pages long. Mm -hmm. uh, and really good information, but we're calling through that and basically deleting what's no longer relevant. So we'll have new updated information. Um, once we get all of our info from, from the governor and from the county, I'll probably do some Q&A forums after we push that information out. Over Zoom, uh, I'm assuming? Yeah, probably a Zoom or a Google Meet or, or what have you. We'll have the uh, FAQ out. We've re-upped the COVID uh, email um, that if, you, if your child does test positive, um, there's a dedicated email per school that goes to key personnel. And last year we have on our website the Just Ask button, which is a way that people can click one button, identify the topic that they have a question, type it in a, in a box and hit send, and that gets directed to various personnel um, immediately. It shows up as, as an email. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Lisa? And we have some great questions tonight. Um, I think just to make sure I was clear, Joe, the, there, there will be forums for, for families and things? We yeah, we'll have to, yeah, as, it, as soon as we have all of our uh, directives and marching orders, I'm sure there are going to be more questions, and, and I'll make sure myself and other members of the team are available. Um, 
the elementary schools, you know, they have their orientations next Tuesday and Wednesday, so they'll share, you know, particulars of lunch or, or what have you uh, at those opportunities and probably over a Zoom. But, um, you know, to, to, to have one now um, without all of these answers would, you know, I don't know and would create frustration. I'm, you know, a lot of answers are going to be we don't know yet and, and that just, you know, perpetuates frustration. But as soon as we have all the information, we will get it out directly, email to, to parents, put it online, uh, and then we'll schedule those forms with enough time for people to participate. Mm -hmm. Is that it, Bill? Joe, first off, thank you for all the information you've been providing us. Um, I'm trying to understand how to digest the information that's going to be coming to us going forward. Specifically, and I don't even know if you'll be able to answer it, but hopefully you can. Uh, relating to the governor not being able to give an executive order anymore regarding to health related rules. Right now it sounds like the governor is um, suggesting to the state health department to make some decisions, but yet it's our county health department that's going to be telling us what we can and can't do. Can the state health department, the governor can't, sounds like the governor can't dictate to the state health department. Can the state health department dictate to the counties? Okay, so it's not a, another suggestion. So right. once we get past the governor connection to the state health department, the state health department yep. can dictate to the yep. entire state. Yep. Okay, yep. so that and, and consistency. And they basically, the, the way it trickles out is they basically deputize the county department of health um, Forced choice, free choice, no choice, right? And then we become deputies of the County Department of Health to do the contact tracing, identify, you know, uh, vaccination status, all of that kind of stuff. So it, it certainly trickles down. Yeah. Now, now the reason I, I don't I don't want to get caught up on the executive order piece, but the governor felt it was important to have a number of executive orders last year from uh, public. Uh, uh, public meetings, whether school board meetings or the town council or you know whoever uh, the, the the county legislature could could meet remotely. That was one executive order. Another executive order was around school funding and other things. The legislature um, basically, for lack of a better term, stripped him of his future, stripped him and future governors of their ability to make such widespread executive orders without consent from the assembly and the senate so now the incoming governor has to abide by that so one of two things would happen one she would get the senate and assembly's approval to execute her plan which she's outlined or she'll tell the health department the state health department they will tell the county health department and it comes down to us so either way, it will end up on our lap. <laughs> uh, it's a matter of which which uh, which fork in the road they take. Okay, I'm just. It sounds like this will potentially give us more consistency, which uh, is a good thing. I think Not it, that neighboring districts are doing different things. Yes, and, and 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 that's part of the frustration is that there are districts throughout the state that said, okay, let's tackle this, and they made very uh, specific and independent decisions for their school communities and and now those are going to be undone because there's going to be a, a statewide approach. Now, politics got into what motivated um, Albany to take the powers of executive order away from the governor last year, but that actually was the most efficient communication tool. I've got to make a decision, here's the decision, it's uniform, get going. Right, and then we'll revisit it along the way. But that's why the incoming governor, or she's she's our governor now, you know, that's why there appears to be this sort of drip drip because she's going to tell someone else to mandate it because she can't mandate it herself. Thank you. You're welcome. All right, so I think we had a, an excellent round of questions and I think everybody's asked all the questions. I had. I just wanted to reiterate one thing that Alexis brought up about the board talking about these issues. This is the board talking about these issues. We don't have secret meetings where we talk about them outside of the open meetings because the open meetings law. So 
Um, all of our discussions about health and safety issues have been held here. Do you have anything else for superintendents? That's a lot. No. That is yeah. a lot. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, John. <laughs> uh, one topic. All right, so that brings us, I believe, to our audience comments section. Tonight, the audience comments section will be on agenda items only, including what Mr. Hockrider has already spoken about. In order to maintain an orderly meeting, the board has established the following guidelines for those wishing to address the board. Each speaker should sign in with the district clerk prior to commenting. When called, each speaker should step up to the podium and state their name and affiliation if applicable prior to starting their comment. Letters, petitions, or other written material should be handed to the district clerk. Each speaker is permitted three minutes for their comments and must be recognized by the board president. And Anderson will be timing the three minutes and we'll give you a 30 second countdown. The board will listen to comments but will not necessarily debate or discuss items. Operational matters will be directed to school administrators for handling. The board is not permitted to address personnel or individual student matters in open session. The board may limit the president's comments in order to give time to others wishing to speak on other items as well as to maintain meeting efficiency. The board expects comments to be made without interference from the audience and in a civil manner. Generally, we um, allot about 15 minutes for audience comments, but the board can decide to extend that time period as they so choose. Do we have anybody signed up to comment this evening? Yes, we do. Um, the first one, person is Mariella Harris Lolo. <laughs> <laughs> So I reviewed the agenda and the code of conduct uh, document, Article I, Introduction, Article F, Mental Health, Article K, Board of Education. Um, good evening. I want to first start by saying how disappointed I am with the lack of professionalism. When I stood up here two weeks ago, I was not listened to or looked at by some. I find it disrespectful and I just expect more, a lot more. Cell phones should be away. Professionals should be adhered, professionalism should be adhered to. I would never be looking away or on a cell phone if one of my clients was speaking to me, never. We, the community, the taxpayers, come here to speak to you and deserve an attentive and receptive audience. I also find it unacceptable that no one followed up with me. It has been two weeks since my request for research on the impact of one-year transition. Not an email, not a call, not a letter. You took the time to acquire a psychologist to discuss stress and anxiety about returning to school. Perhaps you should be acquiring a psychologist to discuss the stress and anxiety of our children being shuffled around every shuffled around schools every 12 to 24 months. Again, I am requesting research on one-year transition and the impact it will have on our children. Children are resilient is not the answer I want to hear, as I have been told in the past. Furthermore, the decision to delay the Princeton plan was largely due to COVID and our children not having a normal year and the anxiety it caused. Well, here we are again. COVID has not gone away. Mass mandates and social distancing will be in place. Kids won't be able to eat lunch together as we just learned. COVID testing and quarantines are being planned. Nothing sounds normal to me. And because of this, the Princeton plan should be placed on hold until further notice. COVID will most likely still be here in the 2022-23 school year. If my whole family, three children, unknowingly get exposed to COVID, I will be sending a COVID-infected child into each of the three elementary schools and shared buses. So now instead of one school or one class having to quarantine, three schools or three classes will have to. It is easier to contain when children of elementary age families are in the same school. It will be a contract tracing nightmare. The unknown is upon us, and until we find out what that is, we should remain with what we know, and that is our beloved Furnace Woods, FGL, and BV schools as they are. 30 seconds. I am also still demanding a community vote on the Princeton plan. It was pushed through as an attendance policy and is nothing of the sort. Perform a community vote, please. If the majority is in favor, I will rest my case and I will accept it. I feel like everything is done in a sneaky yet strategic manner. For example, removing the public uh, comments agenda tonight and changing the venue overnight are just a couple examples. 
as well as being required, as well as not being required to respond to our public comments. There is a disconnect that needs to be addressed. Time is up. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Paris. Well, Our next uh, speaker is Rena Spada. Thank you. Uh, my questions were answered. Okay. okay. Thank you. Uh, the next person is Jenny Martino. Um, my question was answered as well. And thank the next you. person is Mary Hillman. Hi, um, my name is Mary Catherine Hillman and I'm parent in the district of an incoming kindergartner and a second grader. Um, I just wanted to say my question was actually answered, but it's really challenging to know when you come into a meeting um, if your question will be addressed. So it's really hard for me to have decided that I was going to comment, especially on an agenda item, um, when I came into the meeting. So that's just a little bit of feedback that I hope maybe you can take into consideration. Thank you very much. Yeah, oftentimes there are um, presentations and those are the actual agenda items. It makes it a little bit easier. Thank you for your input. Is there anybody else? That is it for this evening. All right. Thank you very, thank you very much for everybody for showing up tonight. Um, we have board comments and new business. We'll start on the other end of the table, Bill. <laughs>